You are listening to Kubernetes Bytes, a podcast bringing you the latest from the world of cloud-native data management. My name is Ryan Walner, and I'm joined by Bob and Shaw, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We'll be sharing our thoughts on recent cloud-native news and talking to industry experts about their experiences and challenges managing the wealth of data in today's cloud-native ecosystem. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. We are coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. Today is September 1st. We've made it to September 1st, Bobbin. And I hope everyone is staying safe. Let's get into it. So what have you been up to lately? Uh, I didn't do anything interesting this weekend. Last weekend, I did go to like uh, an arcade slash escape room place here in Massachusetts. It was fun. It was for a friend's birthday party. But then I've been heads down into into Tanzu stuff. Uh, so, you should see a couple of blog posts coming out soon from from me. Well, did you, you did you escape the escape room? Did you succeed? <laughs> it, it, no, it, it wasn't a traditional escape room. Like they had like individual rooms defined with like uh, a way, they don't give you any starting points or like things that you have to do. You have to figure it out as you go in, uh, and then they don't they, okay. they don't give you any hints. If you fail, you exit out and try again, and you keep doing that until you pass. So <laughs> it, it wasn't a traditional escape room, but the arcade piece mixed in with the different escape rooms, which had mental challenges and physical challenges, made it a lot of fun. Ah, nice, nice. I've I've only done one, I think once in uh, in Worcester, and uh, don't do it with someone that you're really competitive with. Let's just <laughs> put it that way. Uh, you got to work together now. <laughs> Yes, we got yeah, we got it out won't though. Be a team building <laughs> event anymore. <laughs> uh cool, cool. Yeah, I I took a really fun trip this weekend. I took uh one of my motorcycles up on a 700 mile round trip oh, wow. to <laughs> almost up to the northern tip of New York and um so basically went up the beautiful state of New York and across Massachusetts, but uh it's been on my sort of list of things to do. Uh, as far as like doing a more a longer trip, uh, brought the rain gear and everything. Had to use it, you know. It was dedicated to the to the whole trip, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Is no joke. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> it's seven hundred miles. No joke. And uh, the the great part is you can use this uh, app, which allows you to um, basically donate every mile to uh, childhood cancer. Uh, oh, and so it was great. a really good opportunity for me to just say, I'm doing this anyway. Let me turn yep. this on, uh, and they give you like a certain amount of cents there trying to raise a million dollars for uh, the month of August. I think they hit it. Um, Anyway, I'll I'll put a link in. Thanks for you, I guess. (laughs) For those who might be interested in donating your motorcycle miles, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, Anyway, yeah, that's that's what I was up to over the weekend. And uh, yeah. Okay, so So, let's talk about like what's going on in the industry today. Do you have any anything that stood out to you? Yeah, you know, in one of the uh, Cube Weekly um, breakdowns, there was an article on serverless storage, which I just have to, I couldn't resist putting it in here because serverless storage is a term. I mean, I don't like a lot of terms. We have too many terms in this industry, but yeah. serverless storage is one of my favorites lately. Um, and it's it's a really good article, actually, that talks about the concept, um, I, think, I believe Cassandra and Data Stacks uh, with their Astra product, which is really around a sort of decoupling the need to manage servers, um, pro- but providing you a persistent sort of application. So Astro provides you sort of a consumption-based pricing decoupled from the need to manage servers and allows you to still scale with demand, which is a really cool concept. Um, and they call this serverless storage. But I think what I liked about this article is they basically said, yes, we're using the term but I'm going to explain to you why we're using the term because it's kind of nonsense, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the way I read that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, storage has gravity. Storage's got to land somewhere. Serverless storage is um, is one of those terms that I'm I'm not fully on board with yet. We'll see how it we'll see how it goes uh, into the future. Maybe maybe I'll you know go to the dark side. But um, <laughs> it, it actually is a great article, sort of explaining you know. For those new to that term, um, I'll put it in the show notes. And I do have a plug, a request from anyone listening. If you do have experience with serverless storage or you have sort of a, an idea of, of some, uh, some use cases and all these things, we're sort of naive here. Um, we're definitely getting to know that, but we'd love to talk to you on the show. So please let us know. Yeah, uh, that would be great. Uh, one thing that like stood out to me was uh, an, an, an interesting blog article from IBM and Red Hat. Uh, their research teams have been working on improving uh, Kubernetes as a scheduler 
So they have a couple of open source projects. Uh, again, one of them I think is shipped in OpenShift to 4.8 and one will be expected next cycle. But one uh, the, for the first project is called Trimeran, uh, which basically helps Kubernetes schedule pods by not just looking at available capacity, but also uh, existing uh, utilization. So it doesn't mean, like you can have a five node cluster and if uh, three of your worker nodes are pegged, you don't want Kubernetes to keep scheduling pods because those nodes have resources available. You want mm-hmm. something that helps you spread out uh, the the traffic across or spread out the application across all the pods. So that's where I think Trimeron helps you. And then the second interesting thing was the virtual, uh, the vertical pod autoscaler. So we have been familiar with the horizontal pod autoscaler where you add more pods if you're uh, uh, seeing or observing an increase in traffic or application demand. Uh, virtual pod autoscaler helps you right-size your applications. If your developers are not behaving and they are you know, putting up, putting in crazy resource requests and limits as part of your uh, application YAML files, uh, VBA basically looks at uh, historic data of how your application is doing, how much resources they are consuming, and then it uh, corrects them. So it might also like delete pods and ask uh, a deployment or a stateful set or whatever is deploying the application pod to deploy another version and then uh, using something called as the as the uh, modifying the admission web hook uh, and changing the, the re- resource request and limits. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, I think VPA is part of OpenShift four point eight and Trimeran will be expected. So you can use it today then. Yes. Yeah. VPA okay. can be used today. So it's essentially, it's doing some sort of like a predictive analytics almost um, by saying, oh, you know, here's here's how much CPU you've used over this amount of time. So I'm, I'm predicting that you're going to need more. So let me do something about it. Yeah, it's not like I, I didn't find that it's predicting as much. It's looking yeah. at historical and like if you have uh, if individual pod is asking for like two gigs of memory, but you are only using like. 20 megs sure, uh, they'll okay. make sure they right size your application in that way and not pr- uh, predict maybe that's something that's red hat has in store for us in the future but it's cool technology i mean you definitely you said it might replace your pod so like do you have to design your application a certain way probably yeah if you're using the cloud native principles correctly or mm. the tools, <laughs> you Top. might like to build an application that's resilient you know you, you need at least two copies of a pod as part of your deployment yeah <laughs> or being having the ability to turn it off because i only have my giant application in one container right yeah <laughs> <laughs> cool cool um uh, the, the only other article i think i put in here was um a, a, an article from container container journal dot com, mm-hmm. which was really around the challenges of Kubernetes storage uh, from sort of a high level, but I think it really did a great job, sort of showcasing uh, what is different about data in this sort of cloud native world in Kubernetes, and I, and it really talks a lot about the fact that data. You know, has a lot of gravity. We know this. It's hard to move lots of data. Like we talk about petabytes of data, um, but the need for you know controlling your application plus your data in today's world is still is still absolutely a reality. So how do you do this, right? And and the article talks about some of the trade offs where um, you know we know it's easier to move compute closer to where your data is, uh, and also uh, where understanding where the data is being generated. So we talk about <clears throat> hopefully a future topic on edge, um, right? A lot of data is produced at the edge. And so how do we, in the Kubernetes world, right, bring that data to where it needs to be or bring the compute to the data, right? And that's, that's I think it's a really good article when it comes to understanding sort of the needs around observability, but also coupled with, um, you know, the fact that we we absolutely still need to think of the application and the data as a single unit. So we'll put yeah, that we, in the show notes Like well. Kubernetes at the edge is definitely a topic we need to deep dive on in the future episode. So uh, we'll add it to our backlog. Second plug, if anybody wants to talk about edge, <laughs> let us know. Yes. Uh, definitely. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to go back to, like in our in, in our very initial episodes, we had highlighted the NSA Kubernetes security hard security hardening guide uh, that NSA had published. Uh, there is an open source tool called Cubescape or Cube Escape, uh, based on how you choose to pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> but it it gives you a, a tool that you can use. It has tests listed for all the different vulnerabilities that were described in the NSA report. So like non-root containers or immutable container file system, privileged containers, all of those. You can run a check against your cluster and make sure that your Kubernetes cluster is secure. So you're not paying a vendor. It's an open source tool. So why not go for it? So what can you actually accomplish with this tool? 
So it has uh, like YAML files for each of the use cases that we just discussed. Uh, in addition to like just privileged containers, it also talks about like how do you harden your control plane and the best practices there. If you have the Kubernetes dashboard exposed, because that's a pretty common thing that people uh, mm-hmm. end up doing. Uh, if you have privileged escalation involved in your cluster. So all of those things, uh, it, it, it checks your clusters for all of those different use cases and then gives you a report that, okay, you need to fix XYZ things if you want to comply to this standard. So pretty yeah. cool tool. Yeah, these are really cool too. I mean, this reminds me of, uh, you know, there was entire companies built around tools that scanned your container images. There still yep. are, right? This is a big, a big problem to solve. It sounds almost like a scanner for your cluster. Yes. Yep. Cool. That's yeah. one way to put it, put it I guess. <laughs> Everybody start running it right now. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, and like just going around with like what's happening in our ecosystem, uh, Rancher 2.6 is out from SUSE. So this is like their first major release after I think uh, they got acquired by SUSE and it introduces like new dashboards and new UIs making lives easier for administrators. But then it also uh, introduced like full lifecycle management capabilities for your Azure Kubernetes service or AKS clusters and Google Kubernetes engine or GKE clusters. That functionality existed for EKS in the in the previous release. They just added two more uh, managed uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, to your Rancher interface. Continuing that support for multi-cloud, it sounds like. Yep, definitely. <laughs> yeah, part of that release was Longhorn 2.6, right? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, <laughs> good point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I think, uh, you know, it being the podcast around content native storage, uh, Longhorn 2.6, I think, you know, some of the highlights are uh, uh, encrypted volumes, encrypted backups, and some other things. So really cool tech if you're sort of new to the uh, cloud native storage space too as well. Yep, uh, that's that's one of the topics that we'll talk about. Uh, that's the, the primary topic that we'll talk about in today's <laughs> podcast. So <laughs> uh, we'll definitely look at that. And then just keeping along with the trend, like last time we spoke about how venture uh, firms are putting more and more money in Kubernetes startups. One of the Kubernetes operations management platform startup, that's a, a, a weird marketing term, but uh, Rafe uh, basically raised $25 million for Series A uh, as part of their next round, funding round. Uh, they have a cool GitOps pipeline model where you can have uh, your pipelines for not just your applications, but also the infrastructure or the Kubernetes clusters that are your infrastructure uh, in, in, into a single pipeline and deploy everything as a complete unit. And then they have additional like uh, blueprinting functionality around how you can uh, create uh, or, or gather logs and ga- gather telemetry, telemetry data and mm-hmm. metrics from your individual Kubernetes cluster that it's managing. You know, I didn't realize this uh, before when we were going through all these topics, but there's sort of a multi-cloud theme here, you know, with Federation and a new startup and uh, Rancher coming out with more. I mean, it's it's obvious. I think people are starting to use Kubernetes in more more places and more clouds. Um, so really interesting thing to keep an eye on. True. All right. Is that the end of our news? I think it is. I think um, it is. Yeah. We'll put all those, again, we'll put all those links in the show notes if you're interested in any one of them so you can dig in. Uh, today's topic, without further ado, is cloud native storage versus traditional storage. Um, and so this is really a topic focused on um, understanding where we've come through the years when it comes to, um, you, know, you know, having storage for our applications and what it's evolved into and how it differs really, really from traditional storage and what we're using today in Kubernetes. So I guess we start with, you know, where were we uh, in, in throughout history with, and we're not going to start talking about tape. <laughs> we're not going to start talking about tape like I promised yeah. you. Um, but I mean, let's talk about traditional SAN and NAS systems, right? True. I mean, these, these were really designed for uh, you know, racks of servers, bare metal, you know, applications running directly on those servers. You have complex networking uh, uh, set up to these servers and there's a huge sort of, um, you know, reliance on the storage administrator, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, as, as uh, like uh, my first job out of school, I joined NetApp and I was a tech marketing engineer on their FlexPod team. And I remember like we, we used to publish uh, design guides and deployment guides for each specific application and how you can best run it on top of a FlexPod. So that just in, not just included compute side with Cisco, but also included all the storage uh, parameters or knobs that you have to turn to get the best performance. Uh, so going from like a hundred page document to deploy an application with traditional SAN or NAS systems, uh, we have definitely evolved. And uh, as our applications have modernized, we have also modernized the storage system underneath. 
Yeah, and modernize, I mean, we're talking about the complexity there, but we haven't necessarily reduced complexity in cloud native storage, which I think we can talk about uh, going forward. But I think there's something to be said there around, you know, one of my one of my first jobs at EMC. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the labs physically racking and stacking and, and plugging things in and, uh, you know, configuring networking and, and switches. And, and I, I haven't done that in ages. I mean, a lot of things are uh, software defined these days. So I think that's an evolution that we'll definitely mention here. But I think, you know, it's important to understand that um, when it comes to, so, you know, storage supporting different applications, we've, we've gone from bare metal and created an abstraction to virtual machines. And and with that abstraction, we typically still use traditional SAN and NAS because it's, you know, you carve a LUN out to go directly to a VM or uh, in that case. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we'll talk more about how that continued path towards abstraction plays into cloud native storage. But I think there's a, there's a middle ground here when you talk about a whole bunch of hardware networking and storage, right? We can talk about how OpenStack uses uh, Cinder for uh, you know plugging in systems to the SAN, but there's a part of this when you lump it all together, which is sort of HCI, right? Yeah. So uh, again, given the complexity of managing these like complex systems and converged infrastructure solutions, one of the logical evolutions was hyperconverged infrastructure. So uh, by by reducing the complexity that comes from networking and configuring storage by bringing in bringing in everything into a single uh, a sheet metal box so you have your compute uh, and then you also have local drives and then when you have multiple of these systems you aggregate them into a single data store if you're talking about uh, uh, vmware you have a single vsan data store if you're talking about nutanix you have um, a, a single nutanix storage pool and that's what's presented to your virtual machine so all the complexity that was involved in configuring fiber channel or iSCSI and configuring those LUNs and mapping them using the correct WWPNs and WWNNs, uh, you, you reduce all of that by just having a data store which will be used to provision your virtual machines and provision your virtual disks that are uh, part, participating or uh, providing storage for your applications. So that was a, a clear evolution in trying to reduce complexity through automation and ease of management. Yeah, and I think something you said there around, you know, it traditionally serves still VM workloads, right? Um, uh, even even when you kind of pack these things together into a really powerful system, you're, you're, you're still sort of uh, working with that dynamic of, you know, storage provisioned purposefully to a specific, uh, another virtualized piece of hardware. Um, and, I, and I think this is where, uh, you know, we have this shift to containers, uh, you know, since the early 2000s and, and obviously, you know, even more now that, you know, Kubernetes is sort of the de facto to mainstream. So how did we start moving traditional storage, which is the SAN and the NAS uh, type systems for containers to start using? Because obviously the, the natural sort of evolution, which we covered a little bit of how containers started using uh, these types of systems in the last podcast episode. Um, but, you know, we started seeing plugins and connectors, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, definitely, like, uh, in addition to how storage has evolved, uh, like, if you're an organization who is modernizing their application from virtual machines to containers, you need to think about a couple of things. Like, there are going to be technical requirements, like, okay, because of the way uh, containers are deployed and Kubernetes deploy orchestrates them. And again, things that we covered in our last episode around how that ecosystem has matured. But there are also a set of organizational requirements, right? So uh, you. If I'm a developer building containers or deploying my applications using Kubernetes, I don't want to to wait a couple of weeks to open tickets and have a LUN or a, a volume being provisioned on a backend storage system uh, by a storage administrator. I need to have a, a, a good workflow where if I am asking for storage, it is provisioned for me rather than having to jump through hoops and going and talking to different teams inside my organization. So different set of requirements when we are dealing with different set of or, or a modern application. Yeah, and those those requirements we've seen changed over the years too, right? Uh, even when dealing with traditional SAN and NAS, there there's sort of the DevOps movement sort of predated almost the 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 Kubernetes and container movement, where we were seeing a high level of automation software come out, you know, like Chef and Puppet, where you saw these libraries coming out to automate all these 
sort of tasks that storage admins typically had to do to connect, you know, a LUN from a SAN to a VM, you know, you know, you know scanning the iSCSI bus and connecting it and, and doing all these things that um, really showed the, I think, the need and, and the itch for, you know, making these uh, operations streamlined for the way that the industries were moving, right? And that, I think, ties into sort of the way organizations were starting to really think about how do we innovate fast as cloud started really taking a front and center uh, sort of approach in those uh, organizations as well. Yeah, like if we talk about talk to any developers, right, the thought of them pushing anything to production even a decade ago was crazy. Like, oh, uh, moving anything to production takes a lot of testing and QA and unit testing and integration testing. And then on one fine day, people decide, oh, we'll push our application to production. That's That has completely changed. I was talking to one of my friends while I was uh, we were picking up some bagels in the morning. And he said that, oh, I have an issue in the production, in, in a production environment because of the of some code he pushed last night. So again, this is showing you the agility that each developer is now empowered to not just build their applications, but also push it to production as and when needed, and then making sure the infrastructure, regardless of the environment, supports those requirements. So uh, I can develop something locally uh, and run it on my test dev clusters. And then if I have the same Kubernetes uh, cluster running in production, I can just move my applications there and, and uh, promote them to the production uh, tier. And subsequently break production, but that's oh, okay. true. It's a yeah, different, yeah. different and topic. Like the only reason I found out that he pushed something into production because his Slack was going crazy and uh, he was <laughs> the production was down for a specific feature. So yeah, definitely it comes with uh, more responsibilities as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think you know, uh, in the storage space, right? When we talk about IT administration, storage administration, you know, uh, all these abstractions that we're talking about from. Uh, traditional storage and compute to uh, moving towards VMs uh, and driving that, you know, that storage admin is still a vital part of it. But then now we're moving towards containers and that's yet another abstraction of the VM. So now we're abstracted from uh, bare metal to the VM or strapping the VM into these containers that carve everything up and it yet demands more, right? And so I think there's sort of this evolution in, of of storage that's needed. And that's why we're seeing this uh, transformation of, of these SAN system and NAS systems as something needs to either change uh, or we need to be able to use these things in a way that's not going to hinder us or develop something new. So I think that's where uh, it comes into, okay, if I already have a SAN, uh, and if I already have a NAS and I'm moving forward with my application developer developers and, you know, we, we have a DevOps movement and we're taking on these abstractions, we need to be able to plug in my new orchestration for containers into these uh, into these SAN and NAS systems. But it there's, almost there's, sounds like you need a, a connector between the two, right? <laughs> you do. You need a connector. You need a plug in. I mean, I think it's synonymous there in terms of what it's doing, but essentially you're connecting uh, a container system, whether that's orchestrated or Kubernetes, to your SAN. And I think there's there's a number of challenges there. Yeah. And to start with challenges, right? It's, it starts from the installation process. So I might have a storage system or SAN or an NAS system that I've been using for a few years now, but to adopt it and present storage to my Kubernetes orchestration system. Uh, I have to make sure that I have a Kubernetes cluster uh, with worker nodes. I have to install the correct NFS and iSCSI utilities on those worker nodes. Uh, going back to the storage array, I have to make sure that I configure uh, whatever multi-tenant uh, name that they have, uh, configure it. Uh, if it's an NFS backed storage, I have to configure export policies, make sure that all my worker nodes have uh, like the IPs that they are using are listed in the export policy. So eventually when my developer asks for a volume and a persistent volume backed by an NFS volume is provisioned, it is able to be mounted on the worker nodes. So my apps, apps can use it. So uh, even though a connector sounds easy and because of the orchestration front end, it feels like my volumes are getting dynamically provisioned. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a really tedious process on getting things up and running. So making that connection between something that's modern like Kubernetes and a traditional SAN or NAS system is really difficult. So uh, it involves a lot of handholding and administrative overhead. Yeah, and and there's you know there's a lot of different sort of vendors that do do take that approach. Uh, you know, 
personally, I worked for a company called Cluster HQ, which was a startup for, uh, which was a literally a product around plugins, right? Yep. It was <laughs> it was essentially a giant library of different plugins for various vendors that could do all these uh, provisioning and attaching for uh, Docker containers. And um, it was pretty early in sort of the movement towards containers, but that that's a prime example of we had, you know, a lot of logic in all those drivers, those plugins that, you know, understood specifically how that's, you know, specific SAN or NAS did sort of scanning and attaching and, and failure modes and, and, and those kind of things. A and lot to, of interoperability testing. A lot, <laughs> yeah, a lot to manage. And, and ultimately, it was too much. Uh, but today, we see a lot of different connector approaches from, you know, Trident from NetApp to Amazon EBS has its own plugin in Kubernetes, like other clouds, Azure Disk and GCE Persistent Disk to other large uh, vendors yep, like HP like- and Nutanix. Yeah, like at my previous job, right, uh, at Lenovo, we had an HCI offering with Nutanix and VMware. Uh, and again, those systems were built for virtual machines. But then because of this connector model, uh, they could present their storage uh, using volume plugins. So Nutanix has a, a Kubernetes volume plugin and VMware definitely has the cloud native storage plugin, which allows developers to consume storage from that one single data store by provisioning these virtual disks and mounting them onto the worker nodes. Mm-hmm. So that's something that, again, it's every vendor has an implementation for Kubernetes, but it just differs on how they have actually uh, configured or, or developed that implementation. Yeah, and I think the, the important thing to note here is like for for many use cases, it it can be absolutely uh, good enough and, and what you need, right? It feels a little bit like a middle ground, like we're adapting uh, traditional SAN and NAS to work with Kubernetes rather than making something that was built for Kubernetes. And I think that's a distinction when we get closer to this. What is cloud native storage topic is you know, some things feel adapted and some things feel purpose-built, right? Yeah, definitely. So like you can uh, you can buy a thing off the shelf that was built for, like I can buy a DSLR camera, mirrorless camera and get the best performance of, out of it. Like, so going back to my Arcadia trip, right? Uh, I was sitting on, uh, on, a sand, on, on the sand beach there and looking at the night sky. If I had a DSLR, which was purpose-built, I... I could have captured the Milky Way. But then I tried pulling out my mm-hmm. iPhone, which is, again, which is great at what it does, but it's still adapted like to for the camera functionality. That was not its main purpose. I, I, I could see a black sky. That's it. It, it didn't capture any yeah. stars. So it's all about like whether it, 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 it's built for the thing that it's supposed to do or it's just trying to fill a gap. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I could have uh, duct taped my my old school video camera onto my motorcycle for my trip, but you know, GoPro makes a really good small camera <laughs> built for that job. I totally understand that. Um, I think it's I think it's a, a, a vital distinction. What yeah. right when we talk about cloud native versus traditional, and not to say that like one is necessarily better over the other. It just serves a different purpose, True. right? And 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 you have to understand what your needs are from that organization. Um, you know, what, what might be some other, you know, concerns when you're thinking about something that's adapted versus purpose built? Uh, If you're talking about like adapted, right? uh, Just having the brand new or the latest and greatest feature set requires updates at not just the connector level. So my plugin needs to be updated, but I also need to make sure that my backend storage is capable of providing those functionalities. So if I need NVMe storage and I have a, a traditional or, or, a, or a hard drive based storage, I'm not going to magically get a faster storage tier uh, if I'm using an adaptive storage. Uh, I, if I want a better deduplication, I, I need to update my plugin and I need to upgrade my backend storage system as well. So it's just uh, delays that are caused because of this multi-tier functionality or multi-tier architecture uh, and just not getting the latest and greatest features that mm-hmm. purpose-built vendors can provide you. Yeah, and I think this is a, it's probably a good lead in to open the topic of what exactly is cloud native storage and for that matter what's cloud native, right? Yep. And I and uh, the first thing that always comes to mind for me is a it's purpose built. We covered that already. But what does that mean, right? So I have a cloud native uh, infrastructure and this is likely Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. Um I think you know having this storage, you know, management software be able to be dynamically deployed. I think deployment installation is a huge part of it, meaning that I should be able to, you know, install my cloud native storage as any other application on the Kubernetes if I wanted to, 
right? And meaning that, you know, deployment and management is a huge part of this in the sense that it should be, it should feel Kubernetes native or at least container native. Yep. And when I, when I mean that, it like it should either come to me as a container, be deployed as a container or be managed as, you know, another container application. Uh, wouldn't you say? Yep, and then uh, having or meeting those requirements definitely adds its old set of features, right? Like, okay, let's say I started with a three node cluster. I need more storage. What do I do? I can just add more worker nodes. And since these guys, these uh, uh, cloud native storage systems are deployed as daemon sets, it automatically gets deploys a new pod on that new node provisions back in storage for it and then increases my storage capacity so that's another benefit that you get you get that agility when you're dealing with cloud native storage you don't have to go ahead and manually provision things and and include those in your cluster uh, a lot of it is automated uh, this is just like the ease of use point that you mentioned earlier yeah absolutely and and there's you know cloud native is a loaded term in general so i think to me it, it really means taking advantage of sort of these modern technologies and containers and kubernetes but also when you when you slap the storage on it uh there's the concept of okay what do we care about we care about the application a lot more in kubernetes and so i think that's a distinction with cloud native storage that um you know traditional storage typically the focus from the storage admin perspective is all about you know setup and configuration and then provisioning a LUN and taking a snapshot of a LUN and making sure data is offloaded to here and data, data, <laughs> volume, volume, LUN, LUN, right? There's nothing as, you don't see the application structure come in nearly as much as most of these sort of container focused cloud native storage. Uh, they take the whole view of the application, right? Snapshots have to be application centric, but also when we move data around, we also consider all the pieces that Kubernetes holds about the application. True. Like application is the king, right? Uh, one of the examples that, again, anecdotes, uh, I was talking to another friend of mine who is a developer and uh, uh, he he uses AWS to run their infrastructure, their production uh, workloads. And I asked him, okay, what do you do for storage? And he had to think for a bit uh, and he said, maybe EBS or maybe EFS because he wasn't sure, like he focused on the application. He mm -hmm. knew what his application yeah. needed and he just specified requirements. He didn't really care about the backend storage. So any cloud native storage system definitely needs to have that focus and be more application centric. Yeah. And to, in, and in Kubernetes, we know that, you know, many teams, you know, are provisioned either an entire Kubernetes cluster and, or a namespace and they're completely self-service, right? They, can, yep. they, they, create their applications based on YAML or Helm or something like that. And that just ties in one single string that defines like, here's the storage you're allowed to have. So it should just feel completely seamless, right? To the end user, the yeah, application and one of the, developer. Like, things that we have to uh, clarify is even though uh, Amazon EBS is cloud storage, it's not really cloud native storage. It, it was <laughs> built for virtual machines. It was built for EC2 instances. Even though you can use uh, EBS for your EKS clusters, it's, it still falls under that connector category where it, it's not able to expand as needed or, or provide that multi-zone functionality that that's, exists in cloud native storage vendors. Yeah, absolutely. I, so the lesson learned there is that because it has the word cloud in it, doesn't make it cloud native, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've, we've, <laughs> yeah, we've obviously seen that with EBS. It, it can be slow. It doesn't, you know, allow you to detach and reattach really easily across uh, availability zones, even though it's all very easy to use and, and cloud native. So it's a, that's a really good point. So, yeah, so, you know, what type, what types of cloud native storage are out there today? So uh, again, I, I, there have been so many different terms. Uh, there are there is CAS or uh, container attached storage. That's uh, there's CNS. That's container native storage. That's KNS. That's Kubernetes native storage. Uh, <laughs> you definitely need to know what these different terms mean because it's like finding out later in your life that iPhone and iPod literally meant internet phone or internet pod. So I stood for internet. Like I've been using iPhone for so long, but I don't think I, I knew it when I bought my first iPhone. So you need to understand these different terms. I'm not but sure I if I knew that today. Like I might've learned something new today. Nice. <laughs> that's that's one key takeaway right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, you know, CAS we've, if you're in the storage uh, industry, you've heard CAS with content addressable storage. And that, that's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about at all. This is container attached storage. <laughs> which is really the concept of your container software being deployed as a container natively onto a container orchestration solution. So um, I believe um, OpenEBS, Kubera, uh, Kubera is the product now. I think they, they sort of, you know, really push this term in the industry um, and, it's, and it's used a lot. Uh, I would say CNS, 
cloud native storage and container native storage are pretty much the same synonymous. I think more so we see it used as cloud native storage today. And that's completely different from VMware CNS, which is their CSI plugin. Yeah. I think they they probably you know bandwagon the cloud native storage term yeah. like like a lot of us are doing today, um, and I and I'd say Kubernetes native storage is probably least common, but uh, you yeah. hear it and essentially it's CNS, right? Um, we can if you're talking really only underneath the uh, Kubernetes uh, mm-hmm. storage space. So you know some of the some of the projects and products out there, um, you know which ones are we talking about? So definitely, like we can start with Portworks because that's where like both of us work. Uh, but then we have other vendors in the ecosystem as well with uh, Storage OS and Open EBS, as you mentioned. There's Robin.io. There's even Longhorn that we referred to earlier in in, in the podcast. Um, so there are a bunch of vendors in the ecosystem, and then again, you have to compare features to decide which one fits the best for the use case that you have. Yeah, and I think at at the core here, right, the ones you just mentioned, right, they sort of fall directly under that CNS label because because for the most part they've been purpose built for containers, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, and I think the distinction there is that when you look at cloud native storage vendors today, or even look up articles that talk about them, you'll see others in there too, such as Rook um, and Ceph, uh, or, or essentially, which is the prod- product mm-hmm. uh, project under uh, OpenShift Container Storage, uh, and uh, even NetApp Trident or uh, Linbit, and, and even VMware uh, vSAN. And, and I think the distinction there is that while they weren't necessarily purpose built for Kubernetes, they've been adapted enough to be put under that category and it mm-hmm. essentially provide enough of the features where they're they're sort of considered in that space. Yeah, but one of the requirements that you mentioned earlier when we were talking about cloud native storage is you, you need or you should have a, a storage solution that's deployed using the same orchestration system as well, right? So uh, it's a system that's not just built for containers, but which is also built using containers that runs on the same, same Kubernetes cluster with alongside your applications and providing different storage capabilities. So, yeah. yeah. In full circle, that's driven by the abstractions, right? Again, once again, we're we're seeing a lot of these changes driven by the abstractions that are necessary within sort of IT in general, from compute to VMs to containers. And when you're built for that abstraction, you can deploy anywhere. There's a Kubernetes mm-hmm. cluster, right? And that's one of the benefits for sort of Kubernetes native storage, I'll put it. Uh, one of the things that, again, I was listening to a different podcast a couple of months back, and it was actually a company called Flexport, and they handle like a real world shipping. So if you are shipping uh, or if you're ordering something on Amazon and your stuff gets shipped from, shipped from China on those huge container ships, uh, the, we all know the the um, the metaphors or the comparisons between like containers and Kubernetes and containers in the real world shipping industry. But then one of the interesting thing that his company is doing was uh, you don't really know what's packed inside the container. So if I packed a bunch of say um, glassware in, in in from China and then on the other side, I'm not ready to uh, ready with the the correct crane or whatever is needed to unload that container. That's going to cause delays and that's go- going to cause me uh, difficulties. But having the same storage, same cloud native storage or container or Kubernetes native storage at both ends. So if I'm, again, going back to the multi-cloud world, right? If I'm running something on-prem, I'm moving my application as containers, that's uh, all all good. But then if I don't have a storage system that's running in the same cloud or uh, that's running in the same uh, 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 ecosystem and providing me the same set of feature set, I might not be able to port or migrate my applications and end up in trouble or end up with delays. So I, I need a system that's consistent across all the different cloud vendors or across all the different Kubernetes clusters. I don't know if that helps, but it just sounded interesting to me and I was able to tie it back. No, I think I think it actually plays a part in it, right? Well, I think we're going to have a topic up here on the podcast in a few weeks that's all about um, how to run and scale a Kubernetes cluster as a team of one. And I think... True. Part of that, I won't spoil it, but part of that is really around having all those uh, standard APIs, not just the fact that your infrastructure and things can scale, but that you have a seamless and consistent way to uh, interact with it. And so I think that's kind of like, you know, also kind of hits hits the head nail on the head there with what you were saying. What do you think? Did we do the topic of cloud native storage versus traditional storage justice? 
Should we wrap uh, it up? Yeah, let's let's wrap it up. Like I think we did uh, what we could in in the thirty minute time frame. Let's wait for some feedback from the users. Uh, so, what are the three key takeaways, or or as I like to call them, like TLDL, like too too long didn't listen. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I've been known to like zone out when I'm listening to podcasts, but Just listen let's to the let's end. wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. I, I think for, for me, it's definitely that we've come uh, a long way in the uh, enterprise uh, that follows those abstractions. So traditional SAN and NAS built for you know bare metal con- uh, um, servers and VMs. We saw the abstractions towards VMs. And so we have naturally had more automation. We've had more uh, cloud involvement. And so we needed more of that automation. And then we saw another abstraction, which is VMs into uh, containers, right? And that new abstraction demanded a new set of problems, which was, you know, higher scale, uh, lower container life cycles, which meant that storage needs to act differently and provide those different things. So, so that evolved into how do we, uh, how do we adapt our existing technology or existing SAN and NAS systems into something we can use and how do we create something new, which is cloud native storage. Yep. Uh, and I think those are sort of the, if you were to understand that sort of takeaway, that's the evolution of it. And then, and then beyond that is what do you get from these cloud native storage vendors, which is, you know, the, the app centric view of storage and application wor- world uh, dynamically deployed across sort of any infrastructure when you have containers and Kubernetes. And that's a huge sort of efficiency gain for storage if you're coming from, you know, traditionally managing a SAN. True. Yeah, it's like if I, if you are an organization thinking about containers or Kubernetes, right, you need to understand the difference between a connector based and a cloud native storage, uh, understand the requirements that you have from your application, uh, look at the infrastructure that you already own, and then make the best decision uh, for your applications or for you as a business and, and move forward with Kubernetes. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps it up. I, I, a, rhyme, a quick reminder here that um, wherever you listen to our podcast, please, if you can either send a message or review us, absolutely do that. We'd love to get your feedback. Uh, also, I th- believe the next episode, if you're interested, is data management on various Kubernetes platforms. So we'll be talking about the specifics of data management and persistence on things like Rancher and OpenShift and Anthos and EKS. So Stay tuned for that. And th- isn't that our first episode where we might have a guest? On we the should call? be. Our, you know, our guest is is uh, is <laughs> is a hard maybe right now. But um, yeah, we're gonna start having some guests on here, so we won't just be listening to Bob and I the entire time. Awesome, perfect. Like that's that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. Until <laughs> next time, everyone. Take care and stay safe. Thank you for listening to the Kubernetes Bites podcast. <laughs>